The mind is such an old hand at fabrication that it doesn't really notice all the fabrication it's doing all the time. You sit here watching the breath and you think it's just awareness in the breath, pure and simple. But the type of awareness you bring is already fabricated, and the breath itself is already fabricated. The Buddha calls the breath bodily fabrication. And from the side of the mind, you're bringing in verbal fabrication and mental fabrication. They're the places where you direct your thinking and your evaluation of what's actually going on. That's the verbal fabrication. And there are the feelings and perceptions you also bring. That's mental fabrication. We're doing this all the time. Every experience we have is taken from some raw materials from the past, and then we fabricate it. It's like taking a cake. You're, you don't just have a ready-made cake. You've got the eggs, and you've got the flour, and you've got all the other ingredients. You put them together, and then you've got a cake. And we approach our experience as if we were just ready-made cakes, but it's, but it's not. We're actually back there in the kitchen cooking up these things. And so an important part of our practice is opening the door into the kitchen. So we watch what's happening, understand how we're fabricating things, and to see that you've got to get the mind very still. And it turns out the only way you can get it very still is to fabricate it to be very still. So we use fabrications in order to understand fabrications. Not only that, in the process of fabricating a state of stillness, you're going to learn an awful lot about the process of fabrication as you master it. So it's important that you realize that concentration and all the other factors of the path, all the other right factors, are things that we put together, we fabricate them, we develop them, as they say in the sutta. And because we have different kinds of defilements, we're going to have to fabricate the path in lots of different ways. Look at the Buddha's teachings. He didn't teach just one meditation method. There's no one-size-fits-all. He did spend more time describing breath meditation than any other method. And it works as the foundation for many other types of meditation. It, as the Buddha said, is the safest and most pleasant of all the meditation methods. But simply working with the breath is not going to be enough. On the one hand, it does give you experience in dealing directly with bodily fabrication and verbal and mental fabrication. But all your different strategies for fabricating your experience come from lots of different directions. And so you're going to need different tools, different techniques to deal with all the different problems. And it turns out that one of the functions of discernment is learning how to read a situation and figure out which technique you need. It's like going into the kitchen and tasting some dish you've got on the stove and realizing, okay, something is wrong. And if you have some experience, you can figure out, well, maybe it's because it's too salty, or maybe because the heat is too low, or the heat is too high. And you know what to do to fix it. That's your discernment as a cook. But if all you know is one cooking technique, and you try to apply that to everything, you're going to end up with some really strange dishes. If all you can do is fry, you'll end up not only with fried eggs, but also fried cakes, fried salad, fried strawberries. So you've got to realize there are other ways of fixing food. And the same with your mind. There are other ways of dealing with issues in the mind. 
The commentaries counted 40 different meditation topics. And there are a lot that don't even make it onto the list. So it's good to know some basic ones, to realize that you can use different techniques to deal with different issues as they come up, and that your exercise of your discernment in reading the situation and learning how to apply different methods is an important part of exercising discernment. Otherwise, you just do one method, one method, and not even think, and not take any responsibility. And that's not going to develop discernment at all. And if you think of your defilements have, having their different tricks and techniques, they're going to run raw all over you because they know where you're coming from. They can see you coming from a mile away. You've got your one technique, and they know how to hide, how to get around it. It's like what happened during World War II in Singapore. The British figured that the Japanese were going to come from the ocean, so they put their cannons in cement, pointed out toward the ocean. All their artillery was pointed at the ocean, and it was fixed that way. And then the Japanese came down the Malay Peninsula, and all the artillery was useless. It was pointed in the wrong direction. So you need to develop an all-around view of your mind and have a good range of techniques at your disposal. As the Buddha said, there are essentially two main techniques. One is just watching a particular cause of stress. In that case, you just have to sit here and be very quiet and watch how it arises and how it passes away. And with a lot of the defilements in the mind, just simply watching them is enough to make them embarrassed. You see right through them. But there are a lot more for which that doesn't work. And this, the Buddha said, is where you have to fabricate a fabrication. In other words, use your breath in different ways. Because sometimes irritation is aggravated by breathing in an irritable way. So you try to soothe the breath down, smooth it out. Once the breath gets more and more comfortable, you find that you're less and less inclined to want to go with that irritation or whatever the problem was. And then you've got your verbal fabrication and mental fabrication. For instance, you may realize that you need to do some more metta practice, metta for yourself, goodwill for yourself, goodwill for other people. That's fabricating a fabrication. You're dealing with your directed thoughts, evaluations, and perceptions. If you're feeling lazy, it's good to think about death, realizing that death could come at any time. You may feel that we're living in a safe environment here, and it is, relatively, but it's not absolutely. You can go out at night and there are snakes. We have had cougars come through. Of course, there's always that earthquake they keep threatening. Lots of things could happen. And then there's your own body. Things outside could be perfectly safe, but suddenly your body has something happen. Something gets lodged in the blood vessels that are nourishing your heart, and that's it. The question always is, are you ready to go? And the answer usually is not yet, in which case you've got to figure out, okay, what qualities of mind do you have to develop right now? You've got to get to work on your meditation. If you find that you're getting discouraged, you can 
contemplate the Buddha, you cannot contemplate the Sangha. Think of their noble example. And if the Buddha sounds or feels a little bit outside of your range, well, remember the Sangha. All kinds of people, all kinds of backgrounds, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, everything in between, men, women, children. And a lot of them had real problems, and yet they were able to overcome them. And as the Buddha said, it's good to think about the fact that if they can do it, so can I. They're human beings, I'm a human being. They were able to develop nobility of character, I can develop that too. I don't have to spend my whole life just giving in to my impulses, giving in to my hunger and thirst, giving in to my laziness. Part of being a human being is developing some dignity. So think about whatever it is about the Buddha, the Sangha, that inspires you and also gives you encouragement that this is something a human being can do and it's a good use of your life. So you can energize yourself on the path. You also contemplate the parts of the body, like that chant we have with the 32 parts, starting with hair of the head, and hair of the body, and all the way down the list. This is good for several things. One, of course, is lust. Two is the sense of attachment we get to the body, realizing that no matter how nice it looks from the outside, you look inside and there's not much to, to look at. And it's just that little film of skin over the top that makes it presentable. As the Buddha once said, whoever would think, based on a body like this, that one person could exalt himself and disparage others, either in terms of skin color or beauty or whatever. This contemplation is a great leveler. And it's also good for times when the mind wants to fall asleep. Sometimes you're getting bored with the breath, or something interesting is coming up in the mind, but there's part of the mind that wants to hide it from you, and so you start getting tired. Sleepy all of a sudden, with no for no reason at all. And I've always found that switching over to contemplation of the body is a good way of dealing with that kind of sleepiness. Because sometimes it may be an issue of lust, kind of lurking around, and trying to put an end to your meditation. So if you're interested in the body, well, let's look at it, see what it's got. There are other times when the mind is really scattered. It's not willing to settle down with the breath. Okay, it's got the energy to think. Come back and think of the parts of the body. Visualize them. And try to figure out where are they right now. Where are the different bones in your body right now? Where are the different organs? And even as you're working with the breath, there are lots of different ways of working with the breath. Another cure for sleepiness that I found is that focusing on one spot in the body gets you really blurry. Make up your mind you're going to focus on one spot for three breaths, and then another spot for three breaths, and another, and then another, and another, and just keep chasing these spots around the body. That can wake you up. Or if the mind is feeling really irritable, you can think of relaxing everything, going down through the legs, down out the toes. Think of yourself sitting in the middle of the breath, 
with the breath all around you, and relaxation spreading out from the center in every direction. So lots of ways of playing with the breath, lots of ways of playing with these different perceptions and feelings. And what the Buddha says, fabricating or fabrication to deal with the different defilements that come up. So an important part of being a skilled meditator is having a range of tools, a range of skills, and developing the sense to know how to read your situation and how to figure out which of the tools is appropriate for that situation. Otherwise you've got your artillery there set in the cement. pointing out uselessly to the sea while the enemy army is swarming all behind you. So learn to have to develop an all-around vision in an artillery that can swivel around in all 360 degrees. So that no matter where the enemy comes from or what technique or tactic they use, You've got the means to fight them off. <laughs>